It is with absolute great pleasure for me to change the card. I'm just kidding, Kevin. And introduce to you um, Dr. David Siegel. Here we go. Okay. Um, and I have to get this right because he has way too much involved with his um, bio for me to say this without looking. But Dr. David Siegel is also a member of our Fast Fire team. Um, and he, his area of interest is in epigenetics and, and gene editing. So it is with great pleasure to introduce him as he is the professor, um, a professor at the UC Davis Genome Center, the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Medicine, as well as Pharmacology in the Mind Institute at the University of California, Davis. Um, School of Medicine. So we are very honored to have him here today. He's going to talk to you about um, epigenetic gene editing um, and how using things like ATFs and ASOs can be useful therapeutically for our children. With that said, Dr. Siegel. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Great. Well, thank you for that introduction, and it's, it's wonderful to be here at the FAST Gala again, being able to uh, address all of you. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, gene expression and, uh, and about artificial transcription factors and antisense oligonucleotide therapy. And so uh, to talk about this, I'm going to get a little bit molecular on you again. So uh, I think we've seen this. This kind of picture already, um, well, it's hard to move forward sometimes. Okay, 13 years on the faculty and now I can advance the slide. <laughs> so, um, uh, I think people will be familiar with this kind of paradigm that's already been introduced that, you know, there's DNA in the nucleus of the cell and the DNA makes RNA and the RNA makes protein. In the business, we actually refer to this as the central dogma of uh, molecular biology. And uh, the DNA is actually in this nucleus of the cell. And uh, this is where the genes are. And then those genes will be uh, turned into RNA in the nucleus. Uh, through a process that's called transcription. And then uh, for those RNAs to make protein, they actually need to leave the nucleus where they get into this part of the cell. Um, and they meet this fantastic um, organelle called the ribosome, which amazingly turns this RNA into a new protein in a process we call translation. Let's see if we can get to the next slide. All right, and, um, and the DNA, um, the DNA is actually a, a, an incredibly long molecule in the cell, and uh, it's made up of these uh, four different kinds of subunits that we just referred to as A, G, C, and T. And so uh, the DNA is these long chains of these A, G, Cs, and Ts, and they interact with each other in a very predictable way. So there's this famous double-stranded molecule and then each strand interacts uh, with the opposite strand in a very predictable way, where A always pairs with a T, and G always pairs with a C. And so one strand kind of reinforces the, uh, the, the, the se sequence of these subunits on the other strand. So they work together to keep our genetic information in as high fidelity as possible. So, uh, DNA is a very long molecule in the cell, and we have all those chromosomes that, uh, that uh, Allison showed you before. So let's do a little audience participation on this right now. So um, let's see if you guys know how much DNA is in your cells. So uh, imagine one cell of your body, okay, one cell of your body that if it, was, if it was up here on the podium, you wouldn't even be able to see it. 
So how much DNA, if it was all laid end to end, how much DNA do you think is in one cell of your body? So how many people in the audience think there would be two inches of DNA in one cell of your body, little tiny cell? How many people say two inches? Okay, how many people say there would be about two yards of DNA or two meters? Okay. How many people think there would be two miles of DNA in your cell? Okay. How many people think in one cell of your body there would be enough DNA to wrap one time around the Earth? Okay. So I, I ask this question to a lot of my classes when I teach. And uh, that la last answer is always the most popular one. It's not the right answer. <laughs> the right answer is there's about two meters of DNA or about two yards of DNA in every cell of our body, which I think is already pretty impressive, okay? Because like I say, if it was a little cell, you wouldn't even be able to see it. And it has this much DNA in every cell of our body. Now, if if we took all the DNA that was in your entire body, all the trillions of cells in your body, and we laid all that end to end, now how many people think that would reach one time around the Earth? Yeah. So it might interest you to know that if we took all the DNA from all the cells in your body and laid it end to end, it would wrap around the Earth, to the moon, and back 100,000 times. And you could look that up, that's true. <laughs> so, so DNA is a very long molecule, okay? And it's a long molecule that has all these subunits. And the order of these subunits is very important because when this uh, RNA goes out to the ribosome, it's going to use the genetic code to turn that uh, sequence of subunits into a sequence of amino acids that will code for a protein. But for now, let's just focus on this part of it. So this little part that's exposed, that might be what we call a gene. Um, and that you know, gene is going to code for protein. And, uh, and in this process of um, making the RNA, um, this uh, protein over here, this enzyme, will essentially read that genetic information and make a new molecule that's RNA. Now, RNA is a lot like DNA. It's almost the same thing just slightly different, but um, as you can see, the RNA is made um, to have the same sequence as the DNA. And then that RNA will go out into the other part of the cell where it will be turned into protein. So understanding how all of these things happen, and I'm only telling you about a little bit, bitty bit of it now, but um, understanding, you know, as, as we as a scientific community understand this kind of process and how these things happen, and the enzymes that are involved in that and the regulation of all of that, we start to understand how we might be able to use that to uh, control which genes are turned on and turned off and how we can use that uh, for the treatment of disease. So for example, with all that DNA in our cells and all that many genes, over 23,000 genes, how does the cell decide which genes are gonna be turned on and which are gonna be turned off? So, one of the ways that our cells do that is, uh, is using something called transcription factors. And uh, transcription factors are other proteins, and they usually have to bind to the gene, um, to a, a region that's a little bit upstream of the part that we call the gene. It's upstream of the part that is gonna code for the protein. And there's some binding sites over here. And uh, when these proteins bind, they're gonna help bring in that, that enzyme that's going to make the RNA. So without them, uh, that enzyme doesn't know to, to come to that gene and, and turn it on. Um, and so uh, these transcription factors can be uh, either activators or repressors. And so um, as in this cartoon, you can see that you know, there's different uh, transcription factors. The transcription factors recognize a specific sequence of those DNA parts, so they have a specific binding site. And uh, here's an activator that's binding, but it's not enough to actually get the gene going. When it binds next to its partner, now there's two of them, now you can start transcribing this, making the RNA. And then in this case, there's a repressor added, and when that repressor is present, then you don't get that 
RNA being made or we say there's no, no activity or no expression of that gene. So depending on what kinds of transcription factors are binding uh, in this kind of control region right before the, the gene, it will tell, tell you which gene is going to be turned on. So in studying how naturally occurring transcription factors work, uh, we can start to think about how we might design transcription factors to do the kind of job that we want them to do instead of what nature intended them to do. So um, one of the largest types of transcription factors in our cells is uh, something called a zinc finger protein. And basically, all these transcription factors have two kinds of parts to them. They have some part that reads the sequence of those DNA subunits on the DNA. And then they have uh, another part that is going to decide whether it's going to be an activating factor or a repressing factor. And so um, over a lot of years, people have learned somewhat how to program uh, these, uh, how these proteins recognize that DNA. And now we can kind of reprogram them ourselves. And so we can make these things to recognize a new sequence of DNA. So like I would design this protein to recognize a sequence in the region of UBE3A. And then we can steal this part off of other transcription factors. So now essentially we can design an artificial transcription factor that will go to a gene, just like those other transcription factors I told you, but now it goes to the gene we want, like UBE3A. And, um, and we can put on some kind of a, um, another part that will either activate or repress that gene. And there's a couple of uh, recently described uh, other platforms for doing this where we could use something called zinc fingers, something called TALS, and more recently, um, uh, something called CRISPR-Cas9 that I'm not going to talk that much about, but it's very famous and in the news a lot now. All of those things could be used to make artificial transcription factors. So the artificial transcription factors work on this level of the DNA. And like I say, they control which genes are going to be turned on, which genes are going to be making RNA, and which genes are going to be shut off and not make RNA. But we can also work on this second level. After the RNA is made, we can work on, uh, on this other level of uh, controlling the RNA. Because if we could control the RNA in some way, uh, that can also either uh, allow these proteins to be made or not made. And so we're going to see that these antisense oligonucleotides work on this uh, RNA level. And so an antisense oligonucleotide is another piece of uh, nucleic acid. It's kind of like DNA. In fact, often it is a, a DNA, but um, it's just uh, single-stranded and um, often um, to make them into useful molecules for therapy, uh, they have chemical modifications attached to them as well. But that doesn't matter. The point is that they also have those uh, same kinds of subunits in them. And uh, like the two strands of DNA, um, this antisense oligonucleotide now can attach to an, R uh, an RNA molecule. And remember, this RNA is on its way to make a protein. But then this antisense oligonucleotide binds to it using, again, that uh, genetic interaction of the subunits. And so you can make this and design it so that it really recognizes just one RNA and no other RNA. So just the RNA that codes for uh, UB3A or, um, in this case, another RNA. And when it binds to that RNA, um, another protein in the body will come along and chop it up. Now, why does this protein come along and chop it up? That's a story for another time. <laughs> but let's just say we have this enzyme in our cells, and its job is to recognize uh, this kind of thing and, and cleave it. So now we have uh, the RNA in two pieces. And so when that goes out uh, to meet the ribosome, uh, it's not going to be able to make protein anymore. So this is not a way to turn a gene on. But you can see that using this, you can disrupt that RNA, so now it's not going to make the protein. So uh, things like natural transcription factors or artificial transcription factors work on the DNA level. Um, antisense oligonucleotides work on this RNA level. And um, we don't have anything to talk about today that works uh, over here, but uh, you can imagine working on that as well. So how are these being used uh, to treat Angelman syndrome? 
So, um, so I'm sure that uh, people are somewhat familiar with the very unusual genetics that goes on at this Angelman locus, and that uh, on this maternal chromosome, these red genes are off, and this uh, UB3A gene is on, whereas on the paternal chromosome, these green genes are all on, uh, but UB3A is off. And um, of course, in the case of Angelman syndrome, uh, there's usually a deletion of this entire region, or in some cases, there's uh, point mutations in UBE3A. And so we're left with this one off copy of UBE3A. And, uh, and one uh, way to approach therapy is to try to turn this on. And essentially, both the uh, ATFs and ASOs are both a way to try to turn this silence copy on. Now, if we zoom in on that region a little bit more closely, um, uh, thinking about artificial transcription factors, we could maybe make an artificial transcription factor that could uh, bind near this UBE3A gene and try to turn that on. But uh, the reason why this is off in the first place is that there's this long uh, other RNA going right over top of it in the other direction. So we'll call this the antisense, uh, um, the antisense transcript. And another way that you might think to be able to turn this gene on is to turn that transcript off. So we could send one of these activating uh, ATFs to UB3A, or we could send one of these uh, repressing ATFs to this antisense transcript and turn that off. And then um, on the antisense oligonucleotide approach, uh, we could target uh, this antisense uh, somewhere to this long RNA and chop it up. And basically, this is kind of the uh, approaches that, um, that have been described so far. Not so much this one, although we have some ideas about that, too. Um, but in the work that was done in, in my lab, um, and I think I've shown this before, um, we designed some of these zinc finger artificial transcription factors. And uh, we were able to uh, purify these proteins and inject them into mice. And when we did that, uh, when we injected them into the uh, mouse model of Angelman syndrome, uh, we saw reactivation of UBE3A in the brains. So uh, this is uh, two regions of the brain. These are brain slices. This is from the, the hippocampal region, and this is from the cerebellum region. And uh, shown in green is UBE3A. And so in wild-type mice, you see green in both regions. In the Angelman syndrome mice, uh, we only see background levels of staining. And, uh, here, if we put in our therapeutic protein, you can see that UB3A comes back on. And uh, if we put in a protein that looks just like that protein, but doesn't recognize that same stretch of DNA, uh, now we don't see that uh, UB3A coming back on. So this seems to be a specific interaction that turns it back on. And I just want to say that um, Barbara Bayless, who was the, the chief author on this work, is here with us today. Barbara, could you please stand up? Barbara Bayless. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, the antisense uh, oligonucleotide uh, was published uh, by uh, Dr. Art Baudet's group in conjunction with I Ionis uh, Pharmaceuticals. And they made an, a number, quite a number of uh, antisense oligonucleotides and found that uh, these two worked extremely well. And so they leave this part of that long antisense uh, transcript alone, and they just uh, do the chopping part over here. And so in chopping that over there, uh, what they were able to find is that now uh, UB3A is able to come on and be expressed. You can see kind of in this picture um, that uh, with a control uh, molecule, they don't see it come on. But with their therapeutic antisense oligonucleotide, they see this uh, um, signal that indicates that uh, UB3A was turned back on. Then they have some graphs. So when they did this, the UB3A came on. The antisense transcript part over here went down. And importantly, things over here didn't change. So that's a very important uh, part of their approach. They were also able to show in their study that um, they could rescue uh, some of the phenotypes in the mouse model. 
Um, and one of the uh, important ones was uh, the learning uh, phenotype, uh, something called contextual fear conditioning. But um, if this is what that signal looks like in a wild type animal, in the angelman mice, it's reduced. But after treatment with this ASO, uh, it, it looks a lot more like wild type. And so uh, that's showing that not only are they turning on the gene, but they're actually seeing these effects in the mice. And uh, another uh, very significant part of, of their uh, study showed that these uh, effects were persistent for a long period of time. Uh, here they showed uh, these results after four weeks, but they've seen it uh, go on for substantially longer than that. So a very promising and exciting approach. Uh, and uh, Dr. Baudet is here and will be talking a little bit later uh, about this more specifically. But very, a very impressive and exciting approach. Now another consideration is uh, how much this can go all over the brain, since we know that UBE3A is turned off all over the brain. And uh, in both of these kinds of treatments, um, the distribution of the, the uh, ATF and the ASO was really all over the brain. So that's also very extremely encouraging uh, for both of these approaches. So um, all I can, can tell you uh, today about uh, where these things are is uh, they're all moving forward, as, uh, as uh, Allison told you. And um, one, of the, one of the main um, parts in moving forward for both of these technologies is that these uh, technologies were designed to uh, activate UB3A using the sequences, the DNA sequences that are in the mouse. And so now we have to make these factors that will target those sequences that are in the human. So this should just be a, a, a hurdle that we, that we uh, can and will be able to get over. And uh, then I think um, uh, there, will, um, there will be only a few challenges that lie ahead uh, before hopefully we can start um, being able to uh, bring these towards clinical trial. So I hope that I've been able to explain to you something about uh, the similarities and differences between the ATFs, artificial transcription factors working on this DNA level, and the ASOs, antisense oligonucleotides, working on this RNA level. But both of those are basically uh, different mechanisms to uh, turn off that antisense transcript and turn on UB3A in the brain's uh, of Angelman mice and, and hopefully individuals soon. And I'll stop there and be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay, the question was, in an easy way, can I explain what the advantages and drawbacks are of each approach? Um, well, I would say uh, that at this stage, they, there's, um, there could be advantages and disadvantages to, to both of them, and I think it would be uh, not so easy to summarize um, exactly what they are because they might be kind of technical. Um, they might have to do with, you know, the stability of the different molecules in the system, the, the way that they would be introduced, whether that would be with a virus or an interthecal injection or uh, something like that. But I would say this about the two approaches. Um, I think, as Allison said in the beginning, what we would like is to try to see if uh, any of these promising approaches can move forward. And as they move forward, we can analyze to see which one seems like it will give us the best rescue of phenotypes. It will be the easiest to administer. Um, and what uh, spectrum of phenotypes can be rescued by these approaches? So uh, I think at this point, we want to try to avoid to uh, pick the horse that we want to back. We want to back all the horses. And then we'll see who wins the race. And it could be that, uh, that there might be one, more than one horse that wins this race. And that would be fine, too. Um, but we want to know that at, at the end, uh, we don't just have something that we thought might be the best, and that's the thing we tried. We want to know that we've looked at everything, and what we're going forward with is the very best thing that all of us agree is the best. Are there any other questions? All right, thank you very much.